Well, greetings, everybody, and welcome to yet another wonderful edition of the In World Review, the show where we um, look at the news and discuss uh, various things happening in the metaverse. The metaverse being our word, uh, coined from the Snow Crash novel, of course, for online immersive spaces. I think is that is the best description, uh, be it virtual worlds or um, related things, although not strictly speaking games, unless they have a greater function. Um, anyway, um, today is the 30th of May of the grand old year 2015, just to set the record space, so to speak. And um, yes, um, by the skin of our teeth, we are not in the world of second life. <laughs> we will be there on the first Saturday of the month, which is next week. Uh, today we're coming to you from our headquarters, uh, Metaworld Broadcasting, out on the great Canadian grid. Um, if you want to check us out, just go to login.greatcanadiangrid.ca colon 8002 colon Metaworld Space Broadcasting and you will find us, plus um, four other regions that are attached to us. Well, quite a lot of other regions attached to us, in fact. But that is beside the point. We're here to get into the news. Uh, first thing, I'm going to welcome everybody who's actually here in the studio with us today. Um, it's um, a, a great welcome, as always, to um, uh, my partner, uh, Tara Yates. Welcome, Tara. Who is probably muted and just thinking about saying hello. Thank you, Mel. <laughs> I was <laughs> muted, indeed. Okay. <laughs> had to go. Had to go. Had to go. Had to go. Search for the button, indeed. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, my other uh, co-host, uh, Seba uh, Maria Cole of Hi, Maria. Hi, Mel. Always great to be here. And to have you here too, always. Now, uh, we also have two other um, guests um, in the studio with us today. Both of them have actually been on uh, the show before, um, in fact, at various times. Uh, sitting next to me, um, between me and Melanie, uh, sorry, <laughs> between me and Maria, is Melanie, uh, Melanie Milan, who is um, uh, involved with um, uh, uh, Open Sim. Um, itself, uh, plus OS Grid, plus she runs her own Grid and the Nation, so uh, a lady of many um, uh, many hands and many hats, so to speak. <laughs> Welcome, Melanie. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And we're also joined by uh, Tana Wells, um, who um, was with us ooh, a few months ago now, in fact. Um, I'd, I'd been on a um, uh, hypergrid safari. Indeed, sorry, not this first fight. And uh, we visited her region at Bubbles, spelled with a Z, uh, where she um, uh, has a nice environment. Um, she also had sort of various art pieces on display. And if I remember rightly, you brought a um, you brought a, an NPC model in very, in very little clothing along, and we left her downstairs, so nobody saw her. <laughs> It's still there. It's still I, downstairs. No, it, no, it vanished. It, it vanished at some point. I could use another. Oh. I, should, I could use another copy. So actually, oh, we, might, we might go into that later. I want to put her in my harem. <laughs> well, it's not my. It's not my harem. It's a mythical sort of. Uh, it's a little room in a castle, which is a sort of, and surrounded by steampunk and medieval stuff. It's all just a position in a bit of a... Uh, I'm not sure you around, but I won't go into that now. Um, anyway, and um, also, um, I can tell you, although she will probably tell you herself, that um, Tara recently has been taking various um, sort of courses and things in a wonderful piece of software that everybody uses for ZB these days, especially Mesh, called Blender. And um, in fact, when I um, I, I initially uh, I am Tana, <laughs> I'm going to have to do it as Tara Tana business sorted, aren't I? <laughs> um, a little earlier today, she was also deep in Blender. So I think um, that might be uh, amongst our topics of conversation today. Now, um, Tana uh, won't be able to actually stay for the whole show. So what we've decided to do today is I'm going to postpone uh, uh, um, reading my headlines, so to speak, and uh, Maria's, and we'll, we'll go to them in about half an hour or something, and then go into an open discussion. I thought we'd actually focus um, um, a little bit um, on um, uh, 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 Tana as guest, and uh, Manny, of course. Um, what I'd like to do first, actually, um, I'm, uh, I'm sure you'll cover your usual stuff later, Tara. But um, I imagine on your on your sort of um, 
what I've been up to list <laughs> is um, is Blender. Maybe you'd like to introduce this by t- just telling us a little about um, your um, revelations about Blender and things, and then we'll move on to <laughs> we'll move on to Tana for comments on that. <laughs> I'm really curious to know more about Blender, so I'll leave it to you there. Well, well, I I think I should I should start by my uh, by repeating a comment I made a few months ago on this show uh, relative to um, people who are designers, graphics sorts, artistic sorts, um, and the software that one needs to have under one's belt uh, to stay current. And in the '80s and early '90s, the software you needed to master was. Page maker. <laughs> yes. In uh, later in the nineties, the software you needed to master was Photoshop. In the thousands and in the well, in the thousands, the software you needed to master was your uh, web design software, WYSIWYG software of choice. In the teens, I think the software one needs to master is something which does three D design and given the the four digit uh four figure cost (laughs) price tag on maya uh, for those of us who don't happen to have the luxury of working in a in a business where we're being paid for for (laughs) our design skills where where maya might happen to be on the budget um the obvious choice is blender (laughs) um and so uh, i think it behooves any of us who who have any notions of of staying current to uh, bite the bullet, uh, endure our steep learning curve and frustrations. Uh, remember the frustrations we probably went through with oh freehand or Photoshop <laughs> uh, or any number of other uh, InDesign uh, kept me going for a couple days. Um, but Blender is one huge bullet to bite. Yes, Blender is one huge bl- bullet to bite. Um, I managed <clears throat> early this week to catch the first session of the Blender Basics class that is being done um, at uh, Builder's Brewery in Second Life. Um, <clears throat> and unfortunately, the series of, I think it's three, three very basic classes that, that they're specifically aimed at people who are brand new, have, have, have opened the software, blinked, squinted, looked at some menus and said, I haven't a clue what to do with this <laughs> and quit <laughs> at that point. Uh, and and, and, and uh, uh, I managed to take the first one because it was on Monday morning. It was nine o'clock uh, second lifetime, which is nine o'clock my time. Um, I wasn't having to focus on work. And so I said, oh, good, I can finally take session one. Well, unfortunately, sessions two and three are also on Monday mornings at nine. But the good news is the instructor is going to be doing redoing the series in another week or two on weekends, and he didn't know the time yet. So that remains to be seen, whether the time is civilized or uncivilized. But uh, anyway, I'd suggest that as one option um, for people who want to just – at least get started with how the heck do I get around this interface? Uh, <laughs> um, and I, I, my, my suspicion is that anyone who has spent any time prim mangling in Second Life or OpenSim, you've got you've got some basic manipulation skills. You already know about prims and rotating prims and moving cameras around and you know and and all of that sort of thing. And so. Um, I, I think that's 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 more of a foundation than than we probably give ourselves credit for. So the first thing is really, I think, figuring out how to accomplish the same things in uh, an interface that's designed for creating mesh, and then building from there. So um, the other thing I I went ahead and signed up for there is a a new series that's being done on Udemy on the web. Uh, that's Blender Basics. Um, and there happened to be a forty-five dollar half price um, enrollment uh, coupon, which arrived in my email this week. And uh, 
they've they've only got a, they've only got about a third of the class up at the moment. There's a bunch more to come next month. So it was a it's basically a pre a pre sale <laughs> coupon, and I figured okay, well we'll do that. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I guess that, that's that's kind of where I'm at this point. I I sort of figure one of the things I'm going to do is bring in some DAE models from elsewhere into into Blender and and see if I can figure out how to make adjustments. Um, <laughs> it's it you know it's always kind of fun to wreck somebody else's <laughs> somebody else's work. It's it's I think it's much harder to necessarily come up with something out of your head entirely. So uh, those are just some things I figured out. But Tarna, I'd love to hear your thoughts at the, on this at this stage in your learning curve. Well, um, actually, I started with uh, 3ds Max uh, ten years ago. And um, in Second Life, I um, used wings for the sculptures, and later on I tried to, with Blender, but I didn't like Blender a few years ago because I missed the, the fuse I had in 3ds Max. Anyway, um, I tried to, uh, to use Blender anyway because Blender is a very strong piece of software. You can make animations, you can actually uh, paint directly in Blender on your um, mesh uh, mm -hmm. model. And, um, and yes, I used a lot of bad words in the beginning. <laughs> 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 and I, I thought, you. yeah, and I really thought, okay, I know about um, 3ds Max and I can't learn Blender. That's strange. Anyway, Blender really developed in a good way for me uh, by uh, having the um, different views, like the top right side and uh, bottom view. And from there, I could start with Blender. And um, what I tried um, was to do the same things as what I did in 3ds Max in Blender. And the best is in my opinion, to start with just the box because of the very steep learning curve and the interface. The uh, interface is pretty complex. And I can imagine that it's for a lot of people very um, difficult to, to uh, learn everything, to remember everything, where are the uh, hotkeys and uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. But if you um, just practice and practice, um, then um, suddenly you, you see something what is nice and then you can start. But it is very steep um, uh, learning curve. Also, what I used is um, there are tons and tons very nice um, uh, YouTube uh, tutorials for Blender and also for uh, Second Life and that helped me a lot. And yes, I still use Photoshop as well to fine tune the uh, textures, but you can uh, paint in or in Blender and use it in um, for for OpenSim or Second Life. Well, but it is the, the one thing that easy. I found when I first opened Blender was that it's definitely not written for ancients like me. Because it's uh, got like all small fonts and everything, and it's like uh, so hard to read, and all the dark. <laughs> and I mean, if uh, if you're like me and uh, you've entered the second half of your life, um, eyes usually don't work that well anymore, and they seem to have made that for uh, like the uh, twenty-five year old guys at the old. station. Uh, you know, you can change well, you, that. Yeah, you can change. That. I yes, I found out the, later. Yeah. I found out yeah, later, yeah, even can, though it's still not to my perfect liking. Um, well, I got forced into blend actually <laughs> not because of virtual worlds because of 3D printing oh yeah it's a totally <laughs> yeah. different style of modeling um, a yeah. lot harder but um, that's why I for instance don't even know how to paint on things though I'd love to find out but um it's uh, just uh, some of the uh, steep learning curve that I still have to um, slide up, as it were. <laughs> but uh, the interface, although it's, um, let's say, unique, not to use a bad word, 
<laughs> well, I, I think one gets uh, if, I, to <laughs> if I compare it to um, Maya or 3ds Max, the interface is pretty close, much more closer than it was before with um, uh, with Blender. But um, the problem a bit with Blender is they uh, can they have a lot of updates uh, or new versions you can uh, have to work with. And suppose you're working with a version from uh, two years ago and you use the latest uh, software um, of Blender, then it's totally different and you have to start all over, all over again. So I, I think for a lot of people it's very um, difficult and maybe, maybe, and maybe disappointing to, to work with Blender, but you have to be patient, a little bit crazy like me, and then you can... Um, do it, whatever you they, like. They overhauled the whole thing, actually. They uh, gave it a whole new UI, everything uh, since yeah. the first place. And uh, mm. uh, worst of all, all the old scripts yeah. don't work anymore. No, nope. it's, 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 it's like it's two so years ago. They made that big break, and um, nothing's been the same since. This is this is a bit like virtual worlds itself, isn't it? When SL two um, uh, that uh, viewer two came to Linden Labs, you know, everybody said, "Oh, well, I can't work that way. It's different." Um, although it wasn't that different, but um, you know, I don't. I suppose it's the price you pay for getting something fully upgraded now and again, and just trying to learn it. Yeah. From scratch. Well, it, my I did download Blender in its in its in its pre when pre UI overhaul uh, version mm -hmm. uh, back in the back in the in the early not even in the early days of Mesh, but in the early days of uh, <coughs> of Sculptees <coughs> and. Um, uh, I had some other. There's there's other you know basic 3D software out there that I you know that I had done a little fiddling with and was able to to do some basic things. Um, but I figured, oh well, let's check out Blender. And I I took one look at the interface, and everything, absolutely everything in, in the interface at that point required that you memorize buckets full of keystroke <laughs> commands. And my, it's not my, like my that reaction. That's the only one that's like that. Uh, some other tools, not uh, 3D, but uh, just think Pro Tools, audio. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you yeah, can have but, the keyboard the just yeah, but, hotkeys. Yeah, but but that's not the case if it's Mac based. And anyone who's Mac, who's you know, and I've mastered, you know, I I, I have MIDI under my belt too, and uh, you know, digital uh, music creation. So you know, I know all that stuff from a Mac base, and the the learning curve I'm with Mac music, base, yeah, the music, the yeah, but there's there's ton, tons of options as far as what software you use. Um, the the learning curve with with MIDI is uh, it's a completely different order because you have to wrap your head around um, how MIDI works um, to begin with. But but anyway, but to, to come back to Blender. I just, you know, I just closed the program and said, forget it. There's no <laughs> way in hell I'm going to do that. But I said, I'm not going back to 1980s, uh, you know, pre-WYSIWYG anything, uh, where you had to, you know, <laughs> to do word processing, you had to learn keystroke commands because there was no other way to do yeah. anything. Word uh, 5, back, rest in peace. Oh, this is pre-word 5. This is like, yeah. I'm talking, uh, I'm talking CPM. I'm, I'm talking you know, uh, Windows yes. 1. Okay. Yeah, I've, 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 <laughs> oh, I've yeah. worked with but, CPM, but Tara, MPM, yeah. all of that. Yeah. Tara, but anyway. Suppose, may but, say something, uh, <laughs> Tara. Yeah, no. so, suppose Blender is difficult for people. You always can start with uh, Sculptrix. That's a kind of um, a second program of uh, ZBrush, and it's free. And you can um, make very nice organic um, models. The only thing you have to uh, take care of is the amount of, of triangles, but you can reduce them. But it might help people to get used more to working with mesh than starting in Blender. I think Sculptress is then much, much easier. And, uh, but also, uh, you have to learn. But that is for, for every program you would like to use, I, I think. Oh, yeah. I was, yeah, uh, exactly. yeah. I was going to ask about that, actually. I mean, are there, <coughs> apart from the high-end stuff, 3D maps and all that stuff, um, are there any alternatives or should there, or possibly even um, support programs um, to um, tackling Blender itself? I mean, I know, for example, 
when I'm looking at um, files I've got offline, for example, I've got plugins to my Windows Explorer that will show me various um, you know, animation types and um, uh, 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 XE, um, I'm not sure. They're, basically, they allow me to view things like DAE files offline um, so that I can sort of peruse them. And I and I, I know from time to time I come across these little programs. I'm a big person. I'm big for picking up and listening programs that do one task well and then quick, you know. And um, I was just wondering if you know of any other programs that, for example, um, uh, a, a mesh offline mesh editor that is quick and easy for tweaking things or, or stuff without having to go into a, a, a you know it's like a Photoshop environment or Blender. Well, sorry to say, Blender really is it. Unless you're a student like my sons are and can get a student license for three years max, I think um, Blender is just about the only thing that uh, uh, will do more than half of what is needed. Yeah. I actually I have. I actually I have. Agree. I actually have. It's rather old now, actually. But um, I have um, Maya, which um, it, it was an educational edition. And it costs next to nothing, maybe nothing at all. It was um, not allowed for commercial use. And it's well, they have a different licensing system now. Now yeah. it's like a five-figure sum for an educational institution. Oh, Go figure. Yeah, well, uh, it's called greed, I think. <laughs> you think, actually, with education, they make this stuff available really economically because, you know, the, uh, the, um, you know, the people that are being educated in colleges, schools, even, and, and learning to use this stuff are the future of professional users, one hopes. And um, I'm sure it would be no skin off their back to, you know, provide these things for more or less for free so that you can actually learn them. And when they well, they don't it, do it anymore. No. No, they sell you expensive classes and they sell the stuff to the institutions rather than to the individual student because that was abused too much. And now they can afford yeah. that because they're like top of the pile. I mean, um, Autodesk is like the oracle of drawing. Yeah. That's true. Autodesk, Autodesk actually did quite a few little apps on the, the iPad and things, so viewing apps and little, little makeshift apps. I don't know when I, uh, whether I need them uh, do mesh. So. Back in the days, I started an AutoCAD. <laughs> Oh right. Wow. <laughs> so do you do you think mesh is um, going to be the principal feature form for content in virtual worlds? Um, you know, we we we've got sculpts and we've got the good old prints, and I guess we're going to get uh, what's it called voxels and various other things that are being introduced. But one commonality seems to be that obviously in places like Second Life and Open Sim, they now support mesh in slightly different ways, I believe. Uh, but high fidelity when it comes along is going to be, you know, content you'll prepare in mesh. And um, in, um, oh yes, in Second Life 2, with the, the one with the funny name I still haven't got used to, the pizza name anyway, um, that also will be highly focused on mesh, I gather. So it's... Sounds so. It sounds like it sounds like, that's it. It sounds like mesh is almost becoming a de facto standard. Which uh, well, of course, mesh has been the de facto standard for years, for decades in game yeah. development. And since this is nothing else but game development, I mean, it's yeah. gamification of business and education interests, of course. But um, in a programming level, there's no distinction between what virtual worlds do and what games do. So um, obviously, mesh is a staple; it always has been. Yeah. Um, if you look at uh, kids like Ogre, for instance been around forever, real extent uses it, yeah. and um, look at all the uh, game engines. I mean, I've um, several times thought about using a game engine's renderer as a front end for um, the uh, viewer instead of the viewer itself. But, um, yeah. well, too much work for me. I uh, just don't have the time. But Mesh definitely is the way to go. Yeah. And I'm... Uh, I was just thinking it turns you know, um, I, I would design have in Second Life are also a form of mesh and the prims that we have.
Oh, hello everybody. Um, welcome back. Uh, we had a short period of silence just there, and it appeared that um, Skype decided to play um, whatever Skype was playing at. Uh, <laughs> but don't we love Microsoft, eh? <coughs> um, so just checking we're all back. Um, uh, um, uh, we've got James. Yes, we've got Tana. Yes, I, I can oh. hear you. I can hear you. Yes, I'm also back. Right. All right. Okay. Okay. Um, we're we, back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, only okay. one, the only one that's not back about is Meta World. So I guess I just. Um, Maybe I overloaded Skype with knowledge. It's got to be yelling. something. She went emphatically about. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, I, I don't I don't know um, if everybody heard what I was closing with because that was actually something that I was going to put up as yeah. a new discussion point. Oh, please repeat yourself. I, yeah. I said, oh, please, I, please said repeat yourself. I said um, that I was actually disappointed when Second Life launched that um, apart from not including Mesh, they also uh, failed to include industry standard avatars. Industry standard avatars uh, are a uh, mesh oh, avatar yeah. coupled and packaged with its own animations. And had they had those, um, you know, I look at all the quadrupeds and hexapeds that just can't be made with a human skeleton. I mean, that fixed skeleton has been <laughs> such a uh, major um, holdup in the development of 3D content. And um, yes, um, I was sorely disappointed that they didn't include industry standard avatar support. Okay, Melody. and the, po the point oh, I was making. Sorry. Yeah, uh, so I was cut off in the middle of saying that there's a difference between Mesh as a file format and Mesh as a building or editing tool. So it, so Second Life Prims and OpenSim Prims are at heart uh, Mesh objects as well. You can you can export them into Collada, into DAE format if you, uh, but um. Actually, or, or convert them. Or con actually, there's converters out there. Convert them. No, the, th the thing Sorry. is, prims are actually objects that just consist of some numbers that say like where they are and how big. Uh, they are not meshes. They are just being meshed to be shown. And this right. being meshed to be shown can be used to export them. But prims actually are not mesh. They are right. not stored like mesh. They cannot be edited like mesh. And most importantly, the data that makes up a prim is much, much smaller than the data that makes up a mesh. Right. But, but my point is that uh, there's a whole bunch of tools that we can use in world that are really simple to edit these things. There is no reason why, why that can't continue to work on full mesh objects. So Blender has There's a million features. Reason, actually, like, um, it's like, not it's not really that easy uh, to make a simplified interface that uh, would still allow enough capability to edit a mesh without creating what's known as irrational surfaces, meaning right. surfaces like, where the four points are not in one um, uh, uh, plane, and those but, cannot be rendered successfully. But my point is that we don't need. 99% of features of Blender, uh, a beginning designer in a virtual world isn't going to use or need. That, you is, can, that is, yes, that is so. What I'm saying so, is, is, the most simple way to edit a mesh one would could consider when um, trying to implement that in a viewer would be to say, okay, uh, let's make it easy on the people. Let's let them move the points around. But so what? so for example, Cloud Party was a fully mesh-based platform, but they had simple in-world building tools. But so they it just is created prim life objects. Yes, but they but, but that's that's exactly my point. There's ways to there's ways to do this to make it easy and accessible for people, and still have mesh being shown at the at the end. And there's various technology in the middle. But we don't have to, the end users, I mean, I know you're a developer, and, and for you, it's, you know, how it's stored in the database is very important. But for me as an end user, I don't see the database. 
I see it showing up on my screen as a mesh. It's not in the database. Um, the point <laughs> that you're missing here is a very, very um, important one. If you take a few basic building blocks, whether they are prims or whether they are born as meshes and can be edited like prims, meaning stretched or whatever, mm -hmm. once you combine them, what you get is you get intersection of surfaces, hidden vertices, etc. All the things that's plaguing today's SL and making it inefficient. While a properly designed mesh does not have those. There is no gain in letting people manipulate prim-like meshes with prim operations because it will result in the same impossible meshes that just cannot, for instance, be shaded properly. But that's a processing issue on, on it, it's an internal hey, it's a mesh it, composition issue. Right, that needs to be ser served by programmers and will be s solved as computers get better. Now, but it doesn't, it's a matter it, of the content structure itself. It requires human intelligence to do right. I cannot get technical enough on this show to explain this in detail, but let it be seen, uh, let it be said, and Tarna can probably uh, confirm that. Tara probably as well. If you want to have a well-designed mesh, you cannot put it together from basic shapes. Mm. Not without a lot of extra work. How about a moderate, not a well-designed, but like a medium shape, good it enough would, for it newbies? Would be the same I, 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 I as got, it I, out today. I think I think <laughs> we're in danger of getting a bit technical here, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm fascinated <laughs> by the mesh well, stuff. I, I, I do understand in the vague terms, correct me if I'm wrong, um, that basically, that you uh, with mesh, you've got all these kind of uh, vertexes, I guess they're called, and you're not dealing with um, so much the kind of square shapes that we're used to with prints and uh, the, the the anchor points you can manipulate. Um, everything's uh, made of very complex um, combinations of kind of triangles, and that um, when when we bring mesh into a simple platform like uh, Second Life or um, OpenSim, it's very much, uh, the finished mesh is very much tweaked to be as a minimal weight on the viewers being imported or the servers being imported into. And I, I think it's fascinating that, um, you know, maybe um, um, the, the mesh that actually arrives with us, so to speak, might just, um, you know, there might be elementary editing that could be done in world at a future point, um, even though you wouldn't be able to recreate or build mesh using in world tools because the, the complexity is creating it um, a far mm. too great. I know, for example, with sculptures, which are not a mesh, but they are, they're also not quite the same as standard brims. The, I, I often um, I, I often take the first things like landscaping, shape, uh, rocks, and um, all sorts of things. I simply take random shapes and distort them to get a shape that I want, like the texture to use as a component. Now, they're clear. Stop clear. These are meshes, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, uh, okay. Well, yeah, that figures. That, 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 that in some ways figures because I, um, I actually delight in getting unpredict uh, unpredictable results. Because um, these things, you know, somebody makes a sculpt of a certain shape and it's maybe, maybe it's available, you know, you can scale it um, rather than, you know, edit, edit link parts or um, scale individual planes. But actually what I like doing is disrupting it completely, you know, taking something that's shaped like a bowl that's a sculpt and warping it into something, hey, that'd be convenient as a path. <laughs> you know, and you know, it's really touch and go. I just manipulate the shapes like plasticity and see what I get and think, well, I've got one there that joins with another one might just work, you know. Um, so, I mean, I, I think, you know, but obviously every time I touch a sculpt, I realise that I can only do so much because, uh, well, as you say, it's a form of mesh. It's, um, you know, it's very... Um, it's got an intrinsic design to it and all its curves and everything else. And all I can do is warp those as, as a body rather than actually re-manipulate them using the individual planes. You're touching on a very important point here. And this is probably one of the things that could be done. Um, you see, when you're talking the sculpty, um, what you're seeing is that strange sculpt texture that nobody can make, he make heads or tails of. Well, in yeah. fact, that sculpt texture isn't really a 
a meaning in itself, but it's just a way to uh, specify the mesh. No, no different than Colada is. But the yeah. difference between a Sculpty and a, a real mesh is on the Sculpty, you have a fixed number of points that you can move around. You cannot take them away. You cannot add more. Yeah. That editing is probably possible to do in an in-world editor. It just hasn't been done. Right, great. So, yeah, that's no, sort of what no, I was thinking. So, a finished no. mesh. Yeah, uh, sorry. Yes, yeah, Tana. Yeah. yeah. What I don't understand is that most people like to keep um, their sculptures because it's so easy. And uh, I think it's the other way around. For me, I was so glad we could use Mesh in Second Life and OpenSim because it's much, much harder to create a good model in uh, a sculpt because yeah. you have only a sphere instead of or, or that you can work with a mesh a mesh can be precise you can use a few phases to get something you're, nice you're just saying you just said the important thing a mesh can be precise but it means the user needs to have the um, mental image of what they want to construct uh, in such a precise form it's not just pushing a few dots around designing no. a mesh and designing a mesh topology that's actually oh, yeah properly shadable is an art in itself. That's the uh, thing. That's true, but um, in my experience is that the sculpty is much harder to get right. I'm not talking about the textures, but I'm talking about the model itself. It's much harder to create, for example, a, a, a face of a, of a, a human than uh, using, uh, for example, an, a mesh. Yes, so that I, is true. I really don't. And you have in if you uh, use a, or create a, a sculpty or a mesh, you have to deal with the in interface anyway. There is no difference in that case. There and is. So there is because uh, you can create sculptures in uh, programs that allow you to rotate basic shapes, like uh, yeah. for instance, make a vase in two easy steps, and uh, then you can just tweak some vertices here, some vertices there, move them around a little bit. A child can do it. Actually, a child can do it because uh, when we it's, when we um, went and um, booked a um, stall at the Linux Tag uh, three years ago. We actually set up four computers, and what we did is we invited the children, showed them how to move the mouse, showed them how to move the stuff, and let them build. And those amazing things that they put together. Oh. Child, a child can do it, moving mm. just things around. But, um, you know, creating new points, connecting them, splitting faces, all these thoughts of topologies that are so natural to you, uh, they are actually part of that learning curve that these people have not gone through. These children would not understand Blender, even if you explained the interface, just leave out the complexity of the interface. They would not understand the subject matter as much it, as they could just moving things around. Anybody can move this, things around. This, this is funny, isn't it? Because, you know, I'm uh, with a history in uh, well, just all sorts of design, but graphic design where I'm dealing with component parts, for example. I mean, um, you know, you look at uh, kind of arts and, you know, there's somewhere, or there's quite a huge amount of overlap, there's a distinction between the artist and the craftsman. And there's something very instinctive I think, about art, which is like um, putting parts together, moving things around to get what you want. And the craftsman who really knows the, um, you know, they're, they're more like a sculptor. They, you know, there's nothing you can move around to get what you want. You've got to have, you've got to be a craftsman to actually achieve that end. And, um, you know, I, 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 I've I got um, on the region next door to this, I, 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 I've imported a sculpt. Um, uh, that I picked up from somewhere and um, I, it was just a shape I thought I could play with as a rock and it actually was a human head and so I didn't distort it I just scaled it to the size I want and plumped it on top of the pile of rocks so if you look carefully you will see that there's a rock that is carved like a human head now I didn't create that I came across it and imported it and I put a rock texture on it so it's, it's barely noticeable but it, I just think it's a nice thing that if you're wandering around and you're carefully looking at the sort of clumps of rocks you'll see that the one on top is shaped like a human head and I thought well, yeah well, that's okay I'm not going to make a human head mesh out of it or anything um, <laughs> I, I'm just going to use it for, for that function so I think I, I think the kids attitude you mentioned 
just sort of moving around and playing with things is a very highly creative approach, but it doesn't imply craftsmanship. It just implies that instinctive creative urge. Whereas, um, as you say, you know, you wouldn't be able to teach those same kids Blender or something um, at that age because they, 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 they need to be at the point in their education and understanding of things where they can actually indulge in the craft. Very well put and, now. Yeah. Great, thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm glad I do make sense for sometimes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, you make sense a lot of times. I'm always uh, having a hard time keep, keeping my tech level just low enough for people to actually understand me. <laughs> yeah, it's I, that's that's I think one of the bigger challenges. The more skilled we get, the easier it is to <laughs> to drift into the. You know, the, the point at which you, your audience, as uh, I, I've long come to appreciate when you're talking to somebody face to face and so you can see what their face looks like and what their eyes are doing. And there's a point at which in, in the language when you, you realize they've sort of glazed over. Yeah, there's this kind of, there's this, yeah. And, and it's, <laughs> at that point you recognize you have to back up several steps and simplify what you're trying to say. I think we have a we have a zigzag effect in user interfaces. So for people start using a technology, the vendors add more and more and more, more features to it. At a certain point, it becomes too difficult to start using. People switch to something super easy, and then that easy thing starts developing features and growing. So for example, mm -hmm. we switched from using Dreamweaver and coding HTML to using things like WordPress and other CMSs where the very few features, very little control over the website, but it's so easy to use that people just switch to it. And now WordPress right. is getting now more have, complicated than adding have, features. Now you have more complicated CMSs that right. are developing to the point of full website builders, and then they'll crash again and something else will come. And we've seen this in photo editing programs. I mean, Photoshop and GIMP are so hard to use that we and we have these super easy web based editing photo things that are popping up that have all these really, really cool effects that would take you a million years to do by hand in GIMP or Photoshop that you can do with a click of a button or, or on your even on your cell phone because people really want them. Unfortunately, right now, there's still too, too little of a user base for 3D content creation. As 3D content gets expanded more and we, are, we do more stuff in 3D, more people will want to be using that stuff and hopefully more vendors will start experimenting with super easy interfaces. The people that you are talking about, they are just people who don't have a voice in our circles yet, but um, it's actually happening. Now, um, I have two sons, they're 17 and 18 years old currently. Both use 3DS Max and model. <laughs> one of them does hard surfaces, the other one does soft surfaces. Both of them are trying to learn animations. And um, one of them is actually a musician, a composer. And with me being a programmer and somewhat a Jane of all trades regarding the rest of these skill sets, uh, we actually uh, figured uh, we have enough expertise in-house to create a major game title. <laughs> Little, literally in-house. <laughs> <laughs> Family business. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it, uh, uh, Maria, what I what I see happening in Photoshop as as I think a good example is what I see the spinoffs doing is taking a set of um, a subset of tools, um, creating some presets with them, and packaging them up in a way that someone who's you know a, a hobbyist to use that term can open a photograph, tweak a couple of buttons, and get something that they think is really cool. And that can be a jumping off point for someone who then says, well, how do I do this or this or this to eventually get into Photoshop? And I think the mm -hmm. same thing, I, I, I can see the same thing eventually uh, happening um, with, with Mesh, uh, that, that there will be some things develop. Um, 
I know that, for example, there's there's some kind of a, a method in Second Life. I've never looked into it, um, where if you can take and you can create an assemblage of of basically a prim, you know, create a, a complex prim object, and it can be exported and turned into a sculpty. It's not actually um, a feature of Second Life. It's something that an external no. company is offering oh, as yeah, a no. service. Yeah, well, it's, it's know, I as think I say, it's, it's Ma it can... Mesh, Le no, uh, Mesh Studio, I think that's the name of it's it. It's something like yeah. that, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. It would it, be I nice mean, if we obviously... had something in, in uh, OpenSim for a lot of people because... Um, well, that I particular know... company has been asked by OpenSim developers, large and small, up and down, oh, and uh, they have okay. said, no, they will... Will never leave <laughs> SL. They will never use, uh, bring, bring software into any open sim. They're not yeah. interested in open sim because they believe opening already. Uh, and other people uh, take So we start yeah. crowdfunding. Well, somebody's going to revert. Yeah, uh, studio uh, for open. Hello, um, uh, I just need to intervene a second. Skype is playing up, and um, I think I had better drop the call. And um, if everybody if everybody quits the call, I'll have to redial this in. Okay. 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 I'm back. Me too. And uh, me too. I'm back. And I'm back when I can mute the other <laughs> machine. Very good. Yeah, I said um, I do apologise, folks. Uh, we seem to be having a, a, a bit of a pain of a time with Skype today. And also, you may have noticed earlier in the show, I was bouncing up and down and doing all sorts of peculiar things. Um, I ended up having to go and nick another chair and slide myself into position in front of uh, you. Yes, we noticed. <laughs> um, it was kind of uh, impossible not to see. Yes, exactly. Sometimes, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes these things just happen. And uh, we, we're, I think we're settled in world now, but there's no telling what Microsoft is doing behind the scenes <laughs> uh, with Skype. Because, yes, there uh, was that, with that company, yeah. Yeah, um, slight problem there. Okay, well, um, mesh is just, um, I, I, I think our conclusion is um, certainly that mesh is um, is the future. In fact, has been the past, um, but, you know, maybe our days of um, trims um, and stuff um, are numbered. My only final question on this point, um, before I go back to Tana and ask her actually about some of the stuff she's been doing, um, is um, not whether it'd be possible to manipulate mesh in world and you know find a, a sort of um, a simple thing. Um, I think you uh, you raised an interesting point where you were talking the ease of use thing. I mean, um, I wasn't thinking Photoshop while you were talking. I was actually thinking of um, on occasions when I had to teach uh, freehand, um, which uh, like Adobe Illustrator. And uh, one of the uh, the early tutorials we used to teach was you you got people to sort of uh, draw a line with Bezier curves that represented the side of a bottle, just one half of it, and then you duplicated, rotated 360 times to actually create a whole bottle, and and then kind of tested it. And I remember there were programs where you could actually export that finished bottle into a 3D format. I forget what they were. This is actually a very long time ago. It was probably Autodesk or something like that. Um, but it occurred to me that is a simple way to go. You know, you take um, somebody wants to have a mesh bottle, you create something very easy, like they instruct the instruct now, the shape. There is a program that does that. There's a Windows program that does specifically that, create rotation uh, a rotational object from simple shapes. Yeah. And it's by, it stores it as OBJ, and OBJ can be converted to um, either sculptees or meshes. Oh, great. I have to get that program then. That was suit me fine. It sounds easy. <laughs> <laughs> as opposed to Blender. Um, okay, well, that's, that's, um, that, uh, that's, uh, that's quite a good one. Um, 
that, that that would be very useful. So I think you know we will see, as you say, as um, as as CD um, becomes more popular, and um, you know a lot it, be it because of the hardware devices or people pick up on the environments and platforms because of the hardware devices. Then, um, as you say, there'll be more users out there, and maybe people, you know, will come up with their cheap, you know, easy to use. I'm gonna uh, throw one more thought out there. Mm -hmm. 3D input devices. Yes. Yeah. Currently, they're still on the drawing boards or in the labs, but um, they are actually coming. And I think 3D input devices are probably what's going to enable in-world editing. Yeah, and um, I had. Um, I think it was called a Morphia or something. I had it years ago before I was even involved in virtual worlds. But um, you open this program and it gave you a sort of blob of plaster scene on the screen. And you had to use the mouse, but you had to manipulate this sort of plaster scene into the sculpture you wanted. And then you could, um, you, you could save this as a 3D piece, this sort of, um, you know, Mesh, mess. <laughs> you well, made. but that is just the modeling software using traditional input methods. Yeah, exactly. I'm talking about 3D I'm... input hardware. Yeah, uh, there I... is something, for instance, that's like a grip that you put your hand on. Yeah. You can twist it left, right, push it down, push it up, or move it laterally in either in any of the four directions. So that means you have a six-axis input plus rotation yeah. and um, a bunch of buttons on top of that. Now, nobody alive, nobody alive today can use a thing like that. But um, we always know if you build it, they will come. Well, there is a, a, there, a what I was leading up to there is that. Um, on the uh, Leap Motion app side, they do actually have an app that does a very similar thing now, but instead of doing it the way I did with that plasticine chunk in the mouse, I can use the Leap Motion um, to, it senses my hand movements and I can I can literally, you know, it's a strain on the elbows for uh, uh, holding your hands in the air for long, but um, you can literally grip that chunk and you can swivel it about and press on it and basically manipulate this glob. <laughs> For want of a better word, that's in front of you until you get a sort of shape um, you like, a bit like kids playing with plasticine. So, yeah, I mean, that's just one small input device. It's only part of a greater equation. But uh, you're right, you know, Google end up with these input tools that, you know, allow us mm -hmm. um, to take okay. space. And, it, it will, and of course, it won't necessarily make it easier for idiots like me to do anything because I can't sculpt from plasticine either, or no. draw free or draw freehand. Yeah. So, <laughs> but, but, if, but if, you know, I mean, for those that can, but on yeah, yeah, you know, like the, like the watercolor hobbyists, they don't claim to be a famous, you know, um, gallery style artist, but they enjoy doing their watercolors and they have their, you know, they they, they can do it, but not everybody can even do that. So. Mm -hmm. And I was going to just make one last, one final comment, observation on the subject of mesh. And, you know, we've been focused on, on mesh tools as it relates to virtual environments. But let's not forget the elephant in the room, and that is 3D printing. Yeah. And so those, those mesh skills um, are going to also apply to the burgeoning 3D printing. Um, yes, it's actually huge. an elephant I've mentioned um, a little while ago. Um, mm -hmm. Being uh, in a position to have a 3D printer, obviously uh, that's what forced me into Blender. And um, <laughs> modeling for 3D printers is completely different from modeling for virtual worlds. Um, that being said, um, if you can model for 3D printing, you can model for virtual worlds. The other yeah. way around, not so much. <laughs> Yeah, it's it, yeah. It's two D printing is it, major, uh, more even more than our three D input gadgets. Well, anyway, <laughs> Oculus it's, just, is. it's another. Yeah. It is yet another situation involving being able to visualize and create in three dimensions rather than flat. So okay. that's all. That's that was okay. my point. Okay. I'd like to um, the, um, focus now um, a, a little bit more quickly on uh, Tana. <laughs> um, I, uh, well, firstly, I'm, I'm intrigued. You were working in Blender a few hours ago when I contacted you, and I, um, uh, you, maybe you'd like to tell us what it was you were doing. But um, uh, uh, um, last time you were here, I was just I hope it's more shoes. 
Yeah. <laughs> but last time you last time you were here, I was actually focused on some of those wonderful little art pieces that you you had on uh, bubbles and on um, the, another grid, wasn't it? Um, you know, when we walked in the forest and we uh, yeah. um, and we saw all those sort of things. But uh, and also you have the shop with the um, uh, the wonderful NPCs and things in it. Um, well, well, just bring us up to date. What, what new and interesting stuff have you been getting up to? Including, including if you want to tell us the Blender project of an hour ago. <laughs> um, I think I miss you. Um, okay, can you repeat it again? Or um... oh, yeah, yeah, I just think sort of um, you know maybe bring us up to date on new things you've been. What, what I'm doing uh, at the moment. Well, um, I'm still working on a kind of medieval market place um, where you can, where I create uh, vegetables. That's easy or much more harder than creating shoes, I think, because yeah. it's so tiny and you have to keep it a very uh, low poly. And um, so I'm working on that lately, and if I understand you right, and I'm working now on some new trees and um, trunks and branches and leaves and so, because I don't want to um, create shoes all the time. <laughs> Otherwise, I, well, you have to be, um, or uh, stay inspired by things. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and also I made uh, my hair I'm wearing. Oh, nice. That is uh, rigged and, uh, well, kind of liquid. They call it also liquid mesh. Mm. Uh, so, Gorgeous. yeah, when you, well, it's not it's just for me because there it's not good enough <laughs> to <laughs> share yet. Uh, but it means that um, in this case, if I would um, change the size of my head, um, the um, mesh follows the shape. D does it move if you shake your head? Uh, yes. All right. If if I if I stand up. <laughs> and right. where is the camera? Well, it, it will. It will hopefully follow. It will hopefully follow you. <laughs> so if I turn, if I look to the right or to the left, yeah, then does you it, see. Yeah, just turn. Is... I would suggest you just sort of turn around, stay on the spot, but just turn around. Yeah, for still, the it's the yeah. second life. Linton Labs. They dropped the ball again, uh, as far as that is concerned, actually, because while they have liquid mesh, the one thing that they didn't add that everybody who's coming from the game industry is asking me about a virtual worlds is what's called jiggle bones. <laughs> Ah. <laughs> oh, be so, they, they'd be so useful for hair. J jiggle, yeah. uh, jiggle bones? Yes, a jiggle bone is basically a little bit of thingy that you put <laughs> on the skeleton, the armature they call it, that will move like a, like a um, uh, what you might call it, uh, like a flexi prim moves. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. That and would be nice. well, then you can raise <laughs> mesh to that so-called jiggle bone, so that will move like a flexi prem. So you can have like one of the Blender videos explains in uh, one of the tutorial videos where they make a cap like a baseball cap, and they make the bill um, sort of uh, jiggle a bit when you move the head, like it would do on a real cap that has a large bill, like a uh, one foot long bill, as they do in the video, and they use something called a jiggle bone, and uh, sadly, um, Linden Labs, again, didn't follow the industry standard, they didn't implement those, uh, because they're still stuck and married to this um, strange human skeleton they made, and uh, because of that, again, standard avatars, industry standard avatars, they are so needed these days, they mm -hmm. uh, just don't work in virtual worlds. Nope. Uh, no, you can't. Yeah. Now, to elaborate for those people who may not have heard of that, an industry standard avatar refers to basically a mesh. The mesh is an avatar that has a skeleton of its own, meaning it doesn't need to be sh shaped like a human. It doesn't need to have two arms, two legs and a head. It could, for instance, have eight arms to be a spider, or it could have two arms and four legs to be a centaur. And those skeletons are packaged with the mesh and with the animations that go with it. 
so that every avatar always has the proper animations. Instead, like it happens in Second Life, being forced into human animations and then having to override them just I to look half a, uh, right. Yeah. I have a, um, when I'm in Second Life, which is say rarely these days, um, I, I normally uh, trot around as a tiny little pussycat um, because I can get in anywhere. There's nothing that pussycat can't do, really. <laughs> um, uh, in whatever you know, um, history, the future, outer space, on Earth, both places, pussycats are everywhere, so I don't really have to worry. Then it's also very quick and agile. But um, when I put it on, it creates, um, I, I, I guess it's a, um, a sculpty sort of thing. I mean, all the um, you know, I have to wear an alpha and everything else. All the all the positioning points change and. Human, um, human animations don't work. It comes with a heads up display with special animations for the new That's the tape. exact point. That's the exact point. Yeah. That is because um, the system, uh, Second Life that we've duplicated in OpenSim is actually made for only humans. So whenever you have something that isn't exactly human, you have to override that. The system, unfortunately, tries to assert the human uh, animations anyway. Well, so you have to constantly counteract yeah. them. So you have to have an AO and that AO is laggy. So that's one of the reasons why, for instance, uh, tiny quadrupeds and so on are, uh, sad to say, banned from some parties. Yes. Uh, hey, pussycat, go away. You're lagging me. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, actually, I find my pussycat a bit like way, but I mean, it, it, it is it's basic, but it's good. It moves. It's sleepy moving, everything else. Uh, have you ever, have you actually ever, started a project you, uh, uh, that uh, would implement industry standard avatars into the viewer because it's a viewer side thing. Obviously, that'll only work on OpenSim. Unfortunately, we ran out of funding. Uh, so, um, projects stopped for the moment. Oh, well, the future. <laughs> the future on the other hand, I'm actually considering yeah. a crowdfunder. Yes, why not? That seems to be the way to go these days. It, 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 yes. it, it amazes me. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to get used to writing crowdfunders, yeah. doing videos, and doing it, all it, those glossy photographs and all that stuff. All the stuff that I always hated to do because at heart I'm an engineer. And yes. uh, it, it yeah. amazes me some of the things that get started on crowdfunding these days. And I, I don't mean you know the crowdfunding's been a start to some big great projects. I mean some crazy stuff. <laughs> that puts out a crowdfunding appeal and reaches its target overnight and things. And I think, yeah, uh, yes, I've what? seen some of these what? things where I was just shaking my head. <laughs> what on earth is going on here? I think, yeah. I would, I, I would use. I would use the WTF smiley in Skype, but unfortunately, Microsoft killed it. Oh, they would. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Tana, have you ever tried? Um, I mean, yeah, um, I, I can understand that you really probably had your full of getting into yeah. shoes. Yeah, uh, do shoes too often was a bit of a drag. So moving on to uh, trees and things and, and um, oh, fruits. That's why you know, fruits and vegetables. That's interesting. <laughs> have you ever thought? Uh, have you ever done or thought of doing anything in by way of um, avatars, um, uh, mesh avatars? Uh, no, well, I tried for myself to, to create a mesh avatar and I stopped with that because um, if I create a mesh avatar, you have also to create, um, well, fixed clothing. Yeah. It means you can't change, um, well, as far as I know, uh, but uh, Melanie, correct me if I'm wrong, um, you can't change the clothing that easily. So uh, you create a mesh of a well, I have to correct. I have to correct you then. Yeah. <laughs> okay. First of all, there's two different kinds of clothing. Obviously, uh, yeah. what I call pixel clothing. That's that's the stuff that uh, goes on the clothing layers. And then there's mesh clothing. Uh, with a mesh avatar, liquid mesh clothing will work with that avatar if the avatar has the basic proportion of the human, or if the avatar. Uh, wears alpha corresponding to the clothing. So liquid mesh will actually work because um, you can still adjust the, the parameters of your shape. Even though your mesh avatar, your actual mesh avatar won't change, the liquid mesh clothing will think it did. Ah, okay, because of the alpha. Yeah. So, you can, so, so you so can, you can create still, a uh, mesh avatar and use other kind of clothing, mesh you can, clothing? You, you, can use a you can create a mesh avatar and you can set your human avatar, your non-mesh avatar, to be the same size as 
as the mesh avatar. So the liquid mesh clothing will conform to the uh, hidden real avatar and your mesh avatar is underneath. Yeah, I know, but, but what I um, mean is, uh, well, I tried, but um, maybe my knowledge is not enough or not good enough for that yet. Um, when I created the mesh avatar and I wanted to wear a mesh um, a dress, for example, um, it didn't fit right. And what I can remember well, is it I wasn't said. liquid. If, yeah. if, if, if your clothing isn't liquid, then it only fits one certain size yeah, of okay. avatar anyway. So obviously, yeah. you'd have to make the avatar conform to the clothing. If the clothing is liquid, you can put that on on top of your mesh avatar. Go to appearance and play with the sliders, and the sliders will change only the clothing, not your avatar. Mm, another challenge for me to go yes, into. Yes, another mm. challenge. Um, <laughs> nice. <laughs> basically, um, please feel free to contact me offline. I was just, I know you know, I, I was just thinking here. Yeah, this is an amazing change of conversation for our show, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so well, yeah, that, again, it again like, it's a matter of trying to be not too technical. It sounds like you, you Tana, and Tara should be <laughs> getting together to <laughs> smash out all the, in, nice. the, in, the ins and outs of uh, pulling your knowledge <laughs> to make these mm. blenders. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> oh well, these both of them are both of them are way ahead of me on. <laughs> most of this stuff <laughs> Tarna, Avination yeah. has a different feature actually that allows mesh avatars to even wear pixel clothing ah. by what? yes oh. <laughs> I, for instance um, on Avination I have a tiny little fairy avatar that fairy avatar you can download that it's one of the um, open source, um, open everything, uh, nice things that are around on the web. Now, um, in every nation, that fairy avatar, when I change into that avatar, it'll wear just the clothing I wore before the change. Huh. And okay. I can change my clothing in the fairy avatar, even though it's mesh, it, clothing will change. Wow. Okay. Oh, that's oh, an avenation only feature though oh yes of course that means coming into more garden but well still interesting to know yeah, more worth, about worth, worth uh, the server side is. the server side baker that's used for that um that will come to open sim because um ssa will come to open sim and um i mean why should i make them redevelop the baker code when i already have it as, as, as a matter of fact it's only a matter of integrating it and um well first i have to do fs assets if i if i just had 48 hours on each day i would be halfway happy <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, when we all... <laughs> what I'm saying is the baker will uh, come to OpenSim, but then it'll be up to the OpenSim developers to uh, put that into an appearance module because we changed that part of OpenSim so much, uh, things just won't fit. Uh, okay. Melanie, when did, when did you add this to Avenation? Oh, that was months ago. Why does nobody tell me these things? Uh, when, you, <laughs> when, when you donate... When you donate the code, uh, let me know. I'll do a story on it. Well, I'm not going to donate the entire code, as I said. But you know, the the, but the, you, exactly, exactly. Yeah. But um, I mean, you can do you can do a story on the Avenation feature. F months late. Uh, I, I even, even then, you'd still be scooping everyone else because nobody's got the news. That's true. <laughs> that's true <laughs> I can yeah. do a scoop. Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, we uh, have wait. a plan. I'll contact you offline. Indeed, late news can be a scoop. <laughs> it's just it's just late in the first instance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just, now know. listen, I, I think we've um, I think we've better for the rest to mesh and all the delights that the future holds because uh, we we haven't actually covered any news yet. So I'm going to um, I, um, I, uh, I'd like uh, uh, Tana and Vanny to uh, uh, pop in as uh, Maria and I just um, run down the news. Most of it will be Maria's because look at my Twitter feed here, which you can buy twitter.com slash malbones or one word. Um, uh, uh, awful lot of them again ahead to hyper, hyperica and hyper good business anyway. Um, 
I was hoping we'd actually have, um, it's, it's Tyler, isn't it, from my favorite one today, but um, no such luck. Um, okay, um, I, I can't give you the links to this. You'll have to check them out on my feed. But um, one of the, um, I think it was one of the Hyperica links, actually, was to um, OAR Building Supplies. Um, but um, such that's is just, my that's feed. Just a, that's just the Linda Kelly upload or... Uh, just oh, another place okay. to go and get her stuff. I, I try to list um, several places for, for the ores in case one of the regions goes down and somebody really needs something of hers. There's other regions they can go to. Okay. Uh, meanwhile, uh, a vote to VR had a post. Um, maybe you did something about this as well. Um, uh, Oculus have acquired a computer vision company called Surreal Vision for 3D scene reconstruction. Um, so, um, and it is reconstruction, I think. So, you know, archaeological type sort of stuff could be quite interesting. Um, I don't know much about surreal vision, but um, obviously, the, the, the Oculus, who are part of Facebook, they're now acquiring other companies in their own right. They, they, um, they look at the, the, th the environment around you and they turn it into, I guess, mesh. <laughs> but but <laughs> they, they, they figure out where everything is around you. So it's a useful right. thing to have for either augmented reality or for digitizing existing environments. Right. Now, uh, talking about, um, I think actually this is in the next couple of weeks. So there's a conference called AWE 2015. I believe that's the one that um, our friend Tish Shoot um, is uh, one of the organizers of. And um, I, I have to admit, it wasn't until this morning I thought, oh, I was going to try and get her on. and. By the time we're next here, it might be over. Uh, but apparently both Ebby Ellsberg, the CEO of Linden Labs, and Philip Rosedale that will be speaking at the um, at Or 2015 uh, within the next few weeks, um, even though that is technically an augmented uh, reality uh, conference, they are actually going to be including quite a lot of, um, I guess, obviously, really, um, uh, virtual reality topics in the conference. So both Ebby and Philip will be there speaking. Um, interesting, um, though somewhat critical um, article from uh, Thursday Ember in the week, uh, pings from the Afterlife blog. Um, uh, the article was called The Supremacy of Twinity. And I've got to admit, Twinity was one of those worlds that we explored many years ago for a while. And um, Thursday uh, just popped in again to have a look, I guess, because um, talking mesh, it's always been mesh. Um, but you can't do anything in it. Um, well, I, 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 I used to um, be subscribed to Twinity, actually, but yeah. I never logged in because they never offered anything other than a Windows client, and I will not use Windows. The so uh, time... they're, they're probably still Windows only. And Well, more, more to the point, according to Thursday, they are still whatever they were then. <laughs> they haven't changed much. You've got buildings you can't go into. Um, little city squares that people hang out in and they've got word balloons like comic books um, <laughs> over the top of their heads while they're talking. You can't film in there, I tried. I mean, it, you could take still shots that look like a comic book, but I mean, yeah, it's, um, I, you know, it's a nice idea to that because it was advertised as a mirror world rather than a virtual world. But um, it's it's apparently has just never moved on from where it was when it started. But it was interesting because I read the article and I thought, well, it was, this is, you know, what's happened in Twinity all of a sudden? <laughs> but the answer actually was nothing. So why she called it the supremacy in Twinity, I don't know. I don't know either. I was I was there by maybe a year ago and it was almost dead. There, there was just yeah. like a couple of places you can go. There were less than a handful of people in there. And, um, and and also the the core business model makes no sense in a virtual world. On top of it, so the the idea of having a parallel to the physical world in a virtual world uh, makes about as much sense as having a parallel on the website uh, for the just, physical uh, world. Right, just give me a second, Maria. Um, Tana actually um, has to leave, I think. So assuming you're still on voice, Tana, thanks all for yeah. coming. It's been great yeah. having you here. Yeah, thank um, you for being at your show. And, keep, um, keep the Skype group open, and I will give you a link to where the replay is. Um, it, okay. will be, it will be it will be it will be tomorrow morning. Um, okay. Before it's in there, but I'll, I'll post it into the group. Yeah, make sure you get it. Yeah. So thanks for being here, and good luck with all the mesh and um, uh, the, 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 oh yeah, uh, uh, the, the trees I'm interested in. 
<laughs> well, you can see them in uh, Savvy in uh, Bubbles, but uh, yeah. they are not for a copy bill, copy, uh, copy concert, yeah. con-translated anymore. <laughs> yeah. I, I, Too late. I crashed on route over there the other day, actually, it was because I was coming for another look around. But <laughs> I never managed to get there for some reason. But oh, yes, really? you should you should have a look at my attempts to build something here um, at some point. It's great. Um, lots of I will. Not the oh, word attempts. Lots of trees. <laughs> lots of trees. Yeah, yeah. Well, attempts is the only word I can use, really. But I'm enjoying myself, so who cares? Okay, well, thanks for being here, Tano, and we'll see you again okay. soon, I hope. Okay. Hope bye for uh, now. to be uh, joined soon again. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, bye for now. Bye. Right, so Maria, so we were, um, you were commenting on Trinity, weren't you? Yeah. Yeah, um, the, 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 yeah the business model makes no sense. Uh, say you have the Empire State Building, you want an office in the Empire State Building. Well, th there's a real company with an office there already. Are you going to take their space? Uh, what if they want that space from you? The real office is too small for them. They want a bigger office. It's virtual reality. Why can't they have a bigger office? Um, so it's all, all these logistical issues yeah. when it, and it makes no sense to have your virtual office to be laid out the same as your real office because you want to have more stuff. You want to bring in your remote teams, your customers. You want to have demos, promotions, all sorts of stuff mm. that you can't do in the real world. Yeah. So, um, it, so it just, was, uh, in a practical sense, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. There was another, well, it's just there one was, of those things that happened um, that people experimented with. And yeah. um, I would have to say at this point, even though I'm surprised it still exists, um, <laughs> in terms of um, user counts, in terms of publicity, in uh, terms of pretty much anything uh, that right. we measure uh, things uh, by today, uh, it was a flop. I think, um, I think there's a fundamental difference here. I was involved slightly and they never got any funding, so it never went anywhere. Although we, uh, I did get to see my photo realistic avatar walking around on French television, actually, which was a bit of a shock because it was being really scammed for by Bill myself. Um, I, it never really had a name, but um, it was another sort of mirror world project that was working with like a lot of open source maps, and it was basically um, taking maps of the world and um, creating um, simulations based on a, a real-time map of the world. And the, the idea was it was open source, then users would contribute, they would upload textures, photographs, everything, any components that would help make the environment, and they would be able to take their own homes and um, claim, you know, claim their, their, their own real-world address. Um, to create well, modeling the real world in a yeah. virtual right. world is something that has um, been done several times. There's actually one company, and the name escapes me, uh, that is doing it. And um, as a matter of fact, while the DOD, the Department of Defense, is uh, working with OpenSim in the Moses project, they also seem to have a companion project using one of those real world modeling companies as a second base of operations. So uh, I think that uh, idea is still alive and well. Plus, think, there's yeah, Google. It, Google think, has mapped the entire planet, yeah. and you can put on the Google Cardboard, and you could wander around the entire planet in 3D already. Yeah, with um, yeah, photos. So, yeah, I, I, I think that you know, basically, they are very separate things. And um, I mean, uh, uh, Trinity, I think, is hopeless on a lot of levels, but. Um, you know, um, as you say, I mean, the, the virtual world empowers us to do things that aren't possible in real life. We can extend things, you know, we can have a small office in the real world, we can have a gigantic skyscraper office in the virtual world, and we can communicate virtually to a, a larger extent than we can maybe in the, the real world. Um, on the other hand, I can see that in the world of augmented reality and, uh, you know, the devices that track you on maps and stuff like that, that there might be a future for a kind of simulation of, um, of the real world, uh, which is created out of your, your, you know, your movements with your mobiles and um, all, the, all the data uh, that is fed into that. But I do see them as sort of separate things. I think there's a a creative aspect to virtual worlds that a mirror world can't really have. 
because it is by virtue of its name, really, a mirror world, you know. Well, uh, that may be so, but um, if you consider the concept of pocket universes, um, something that's um, actually uh, quite popular in uh, science fiction now, imagine that you have a, a mirror world that mirrors the real world, but you go through a door into a house entering a pocket universe that is a virtual world. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and different, different uh, parallels, different dimensions, different timelines. <laughs> build know. and and building on that, um, we'll probably <laughs> have multiple takes on the same virtual space. So, for example, I might pay someone for or get a free open source one, three D map of New York City, and use that as the basis for my game or my business location or whatever I want to put in there and edit it and rearrange it the way I want it. Been there, done that. Um, uh, GTA this... 5 is Los Angeles. Exactly. exactly. As a matter of fact, when my son uh, drives down the uh, streets, I recognize the Beverly Center. Exactly. So we'll probably see a lot more of that. Uh, just the same way that if you Google New York, you're going to get a lot of New York websites. You're going to yeah, get a lot of, you know, because so, there's nothing stopping you. For, if you don't like someone's version of New York, you can make your own. Grand Theft Auto is too violent or not violent enough. You can, you know, make your own that's even more violent. And I think, you know, the idea of a unified sort of mirror, mirror world is also... Um, uh, as much as we look at places like Second Life or like the totality of the hypergrid and sort of um, say, you know, this is bigger than such and such a city or such and such a country or a state, um, uh, uh, the actual scaling of something that was um, as confined and direct as a mirror world would be, I think, very awkward. I mean, can you imagine actually having to bring up a simulation of a very square inch of the, uh, of the planet at real life scale? You know, it's a different enterprise from um, anything we're doing with it, you know, sort of, um, you know, creative environments, I think. So, but I'm sure it will come. I'm sure it will come. Uh, nobody stuff. says that today's technology can do it. But if you look at today's technology and you look at technology from 100 years ago and you look 100 years in the future at the same um, exponential rate of development, uh, uh, the sky is the limit. Hey, the oh, sky yeah. is not the limit, actually. The universe is probably <laughs> the limit. Yeah. Well, exactly. I mean, yeah, yeah, I've only got Wait a second. Look. Weren't I, you just talking about pocket universes? So the universe is not the limit. Uh, who, know, know, who knows know. what universes <laughs> I have in my pockets? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, the universe is, uh, is, uh, is only limited by the presence of other universes, etc., etc. Yeah, um, uh, God, I've only got to look back to 1970 or the late 60s to, to realize that progress has been. <laughs> Yeah, and a couple of months ago, I was actually visiting a computer museum with uh, my kids, yeah. and um, we didn't take a guided tour. I did the tour guidance because yeah. um, pretty much everything that was laying around there on ancient technology, I recognized from my own experience. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, I remember having to use that contraption. <laughs> like, for instance, um, remember? And does anybody remember the Altair computer system? Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> then, you, then, then you know that the bus back plane was actually not a bus, but it was wires. And you had to resort them every time you got a new board. <laughs> so I that's why I could explain to my kids why there was a soldering iron in the display case next to the computer. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Oh, what's that they say? <laughs> oh, that's uh, yeah. Well, I guess motherboard makers still use soldering irons of a sort. Interesting stuff. Yeah. Okay. Well. Well, I can use a soldering iron still. <laughs> I can use a rework station too. Yeah, I can. I can still use a soldering iron. I've got one somewhere. Not that I have done for a long while. Okay, Maria also had the post. Um, well, um, it was in several places. Uh, Bright canopies viewer, which is. Uh, successor to on live, as it were, uh, using this mm -hmm. frame service. Um, it now actually supports voice and uploads, and uh, it works just as well with open send grids as it does with Second Life. This is the case, no, I think. Yep, I tried it out this week. Um, it was very cool. It was pretty darn fast, even though I was more than 2,000 miles away from the data center. Um, it was pretty. It was pretty cheap. It's like 80 cents per hour, and they bill in 15 minutes in increments. And that will probably be adapted a little bit when they go live. Um, they've got the official Second Life viewer, and they and they have Firestorm. Um, 
And what was really cool is that you can link it with just a, a simple, super simple interface to your Dropbox account. And so you can upload and download files into Dropbox um, because, of course, the whole thing runs on a virtual machine in the cloud somewhere. So you don't want to be storing stuff on the virtual machine's local drive because, you know, you'll never get them out again. Um, yeah. So so it was super easy. Uh, everything worked. Um, uh, and the, the thing I was really surprised by is that it, it's remembered all my preferences. I mean, I had to set them the first time I logged in. But yeah. then after that, it knew where I was. I it remembered my grid, remembered my login. So that was really convenient. Um, they did an excellent job very quickly. Really, really super nice interface. I really commend them. They did a fantastic job. Great. Okay. Um, yeah, that, that, that sounds good. In the advent, <laughs> in the advent of uh, the way my computers are going at the moment, I may be, I may, may be reduced to streaming. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I hope not, but I mean, it's great that we, we can do that. That's it, that's it. Um, I, I retweeted a post um, from somebody, what was a tweet from somebody called Brad Hefter Gorg. Never heard of him. I think his handle is at Zappo Man. But um, he, 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 he quoted something for, um, uh, uh, well, he said, inverted commas, the revolution will not be hosted. A quote from Philip Rosedale about hyperdose. <laughs> no, about virtual reality. <laughs> I thought that was rather interesting kind of quote. So it's not going to be doing any hosting, I take it. <laughs> well, that's um. I I I without without following the link and 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 seeing what else had been said, I assumed that's a reference to his peer to peer approach. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But it's just, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a nice thing to that. The revolution will not be hosted. <laughs> it, it, it will be in a cloud. But it's, well, there it's, is it's, a lot to be said for peer-to-peer, -peer, actually, with our ever-growing bandwidth, yeah. uh, like the UK um, internet um, expansion program um, that actually aims to bring broadband to every UK household within five years. Um, other countries may have similar things. There, uh, we can actually assume that a megabit of upstream, like I have here, uh, is uh, not going to be um, the exception for much longer. It's. Um, I'm afraid it's daft over here in the UK. I mean, um, the the promise of everybody being connected to the broadband was, it was supposed to have happened ten years ago. I mean, you know, every election and every chance the politician says, right, well, you know, we're going to get this done in five years, but they contracted all to a certain company who I refuse to mention. Um, and um, they don't play nice, you know, they're busy making money and um, a lot of the independent companies can, can, can do it a lot easier, you know, the, the former nationalized government. Well, but you know, the government the Ofcom's actually um, stepping in a lot of times. Yeah. Well, it's, um, you know, I'm very happy with an independent company. Although, um, you know, and the, uh, the speeds and stuff they offer are three or four times what the so-called major company will, will actually offer. Um, and, you know, when they say bring it, they're bringing broadband. You know. uh, the, the other thing is that um, a certain company is bringing broadband to, like, local islands of Britain and stuff like that. So it's super fast broadband, they're calling it. It's still ASDL. <laughs> it's not fiber. Um, well, it, you know, it's fiber under the ocean to the island, but I mean, it, you know, you pay premium price for a couple of wires connection to the fiber. Yeah, uh, right. there, there, you, there you go with fiber to the home. That's also an initiative. Well, I have fiber to home, but I couldn't get it from um, the, um, the major provider who would never maintain the property anyway. Anyway, that is a separate thing. I'm not going to bitch about certain companies here today. <laughs> SL.GovernorMarley.com had a post, the return of virtuality or the return of hype, and they were harking back a little bit to, um, we've been there before in terms of virtuality, right? Um, uh, mostly hardware orientated, of course. Uh, Google Cardboard, um, and now, have, oh, uh, Marie, you know about this. You had it too. Uh, Google Cardboard is updated with a new button, the bigger screen, and iOS, iPad support. Um, Ball State 
um, University, I guess, helps the History Channel recreate Roman monuments. And that was, oh, that was humor here too. I think I've got this in several places. Um, and that actually involves um, using the virtual world and um, the, the, the link there actually includes a replay of the program. Uh, that you can watch on the History Channel, showing the way they have to use the virtual world to um, do it. And, um, oh, I seem to be at the top of the list. Okay, that's about it. Um, over to you, Maria. Okay, let's have your um, anything else department. Are you there, Maria? Blah, she blah, probably blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I, had uh, my, I had my mute on. <laughs> Oh, all right. At least, since, it, at least it wasn't Microsoft that time. <laughs> yeah. All right. Since you since you mentioned Google, uh, they had their big developers conference I/O this week. Yeah. Um. So they they released Jump, which is uh, a tool for creating a really really cheap 3D camera. So and the and the software to go with it. Uh. It's it's an open platform. It will make filming virtual reality really easy and accessible to a whole bunch more uh, folks. Um, and, and so we expect to see a lot more apps, a lot more tools, um, all that stuff to be coming out. Um, they announced expeditions for schools. And uh, really, you should, uh, I've got a story up about it with a little video. It brought tears to my eyes. It was so cute. Uh, so the idea is that you take a magic school bus kind of trip to you know an ancient city or to another planet and um, so you have a teacher with, with a tablet and she controls all the car google cardboard headsets that the kids have so so she she like activates the mars expedition for example and the kids are, can look around in there but they can't really do uh, they can't go off on their own and you know go to the moon instead or some x-rated place so, so the trip is kind of like a more like a guided field trip. Uh, lovely videos there for that. Um, they, uh, uh, you mentioned the new Google Cardboard came out. It supports a bigger screen. It's got, it's they moved their button. The button used to be this magnet on the side, which never worked for anybody, and now they made it so when you press the button, it, there, there's actually it, it touches the screen itself. So, uh, so a touch on the screen it would be like a mouse click, or you know, a yes, or something like that. Yeah. So that's that will work with every headset. It doesn't need to have any particular hardware configuration. And they released their SDK for the iOS. Uh, so that means that, uh, and I downloaded the official Google Cardboard app. It's already out there for my iPhone, um, and you can use it, uh, except for the fact that you have to like re stick your finger inside your headset and you know, poke your finger at it um, <laughs> until until you get an updated version of the headset. And if you want to get an updated version of the headset, several companies are already selling them. I mean, they were fast off the mark. And I have a story listing them all. Um, so uh, that uh, if you were planning to buy a Google Cardboard that's made out of cardboard, um, there's there's the new versions are already out. If you are planning to buy a Google Cardboard that was a little bit more sturdy, made out of plastic, wait a couple of weeks or, or a month or so until the other manufacturers uh, upgrade theirs. Um, I'll be waiting because paper paper cuts on my nose. Ew. <laughs> yeah. It does. No, it does, I I have one, and it doesn't actually create a paper cut. It's pretty stiff cardboard, um, so it doesn't really cut it. What what it does do is it kind of there's no padding. You kind of you're just kind of sweating on it. It's you know it's it's not it's not very nice. Yeah. Um, but but it's super cheap, and if you break it, you don't care. These things cost like a couple of bucks each if you buy them in bulk. Yeah, but if you break it, you get to keep both pieces. <laughs> yeah. Stick it, uh, stick it together with something. <laughs> well, well, actually, it's made of cardboard. You get a new pizza box and you, you fix know, whatever the, broke. <laughs> you know about duct tape, right? It's got a light side, the dark side. And so then it doesn't, doesn't matter where you wander virtually, you're still going to be thinking about pizza. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, duct tape is a, is a good solution. Yeah, I recommend that. Well, uh, there was a real focus, wasn't there, on virtuality in, um, at the Google, I think. This, yeah, it's and, it's. Um, uh, it, I, I, they think they're still friends by Facebook and they're trying to get in on. And you um, know what the good thing is about Google Cardboard? 
It doesn't try to snoop your data. <laughs> okay. That's, okay. Yeah, that's true. Unless they've infested it with certain molecules. I'm sure it, it will at some point. Yeah. Memories um, for the win. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, so, so the Oculus and Facebook, they're going after these high end, very expensive things. Google, uh, I mean, the, the Oculus Rift is, according to the estimates that just came out, is going to require like a $1,500 computer. Yeah. Uh, I used to I used to want to have an Oculus when Facebook bought it. I said no thanks. Right, and, and and so they have this deal with Samsung, and again, it only works with the high end Samsung phones, and the headset itself costs two hundred bucks. Uh, meanwhile, the Google Cardboard is going for the opposite approach. The software is free. Everything is open source. They're giving away all the blueprints to the cameras, to the devices. And they say that over a million Google Cardboard kits have been sold. So there's over a million people out there playing around with little 3Z movie demos and, you know, swimming with the sharks and visiting Mars and, you know, all the other stuff that you get. And it's a really cute introduction to virtual reality. You put it on and you're like, oh, that's what it's about. And... Um, it, it's really cute. It's really short. Not much there available yet, but we're replacing our cell phones every year or two, much faster than we replace our desktops. Um, and this is going to keep taking advantage of our cell phone development. So I, I think that Google might have a be better bet here than than uh, the I would think so, Oculus yes. Facebook mm. thing. What and, really uh, have you seen that, have you seen that little mock video uh, that's um, going around YouTube uh, regarding the Oculus? <laughs> It has uh, somebody using the Oculus in some immersive 3D game. And like when they're searching around for a door, suddenly it pops up. You have a friend request. <laughs> ah, yes. right. mean, uh, the, 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 the other modern neat thing, I guess, is that Google, you know, Google are big, uh, you know, um, but also, of course, Facebook are doing all the required publicity for the 3D world. And Google right. are just getting in on it. <laughs> So um, the other thing that was really surprised me is that Piper Jeffrey released um, uh, a, a report about that VR is the next big technology trend. Of course, we all knew that. Yeah. But for some reason, they thought that Facebook and Apple were going to be the two big winners. And of course, Apple hasn't. We, I mean, uh, yes, Apple can come out tomorrow with a beautiful device that will knock everybody out. But right now, we haven't heard a peep out of them about this. So that was, well, that Apple was pretty Apple is uh, currently setting more on design and technical info, uh, innovation. Um, and to be honest, they, they have lost them, their major creative head, the driving force for decades. I mean, uh, this, this, this image of um, Steve Jobs before the pearly gates, the pearly gates have a lock and says slide to open. <laughs> Um, uh, that, that, yeah, that's also, also, of course, we never the thing. Uh, he's been driving force behind all the innovations that Apple has been yeah. doing, and uh, now he's gone. There is no more driving force. The only thing we have now is people trying to capitalize off what Steve created uh, as long as it lasts. Yeah, uh, and now, of course, let, Apple well, I, I did seek it with anyway. So right, but but last well, week, and in the on the. In the in the line of Apple and the line of Apple news that's related, um, last week it, Apple confirmed the acquisition um, of German augmented reality firm uh, Meta.io. Um, yeah, they all, they also do computer vision and um, uh, yeah, augmented reality. Yeah. Well, it looks so, like they finally woke up then. Well. But but they they're behind in patents. Um, I wrote about the patent issue maybe like a week or two ago. Um, they're 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 so far behind in virtual reality patents. They didn't even make the like the top ten or top the top twenty list. Um, so maybe they're working on stuff in secret. Considering, um, considering but, patents are evil. Um... <laughs> well, I agree with you about well, I, I... evil. But it's still and considering indicator. Apple's penchant for, for doing stuff in secret and yeah. managing to to keep things under wraps until they are ready to let you know, you know, stuff just doesn't leak out of that camp. Right. 
uh, as a longtime Apple fanatic. You know, I've Matt, watched Matt, that. Matt, Matt, excuse me, just a second, Melanie. Um, yep. What operating system do you use? Linux. Um, OS X. Oh, you do? Oh, so you use Apple to put, right, okay. Yes. I was just seeing about Kirsten Windows earlier, which I agree with. I use both OS X and Linux. This is All a right. Mac. Um, I call it the Big Mac. Um, don't take a bite. It's a 27-inch uh, iMac with two 27-inch screens yeah. left and right. Oh, lovely, lovely, lovely. So there's no, like I, I was three, just, three I was screens just in one. total, and I need the space when I'm running Avination. Uh, this is <laughs> happening all over the place. I just I just had to ask because it sounded like you were suddenly going to get paid down on Apple as well as Microsoft. I thought, what's, <laughs> what's left is going to be Linux. <laughs> no, I'm just, um, I'm just sad that Steve passed away, Apple. and I just don't, don't have uh, the trust um, in the new people that I had in Steve. Yeah, I think. all right. Yeah. Well, I want to get through some of the other good news uh, that's yeah, happening. Yeah. Uh, now we're, so, we're running out of time. So, yeah, so, uh, so <laughs> let's go quick. Uh, ExoLife donated some ores. They're following the footsteps of Linda Kelly. And in fact, one of the, one of the ores has a Linda Kelly commemorative playground on it. Um, so that was very sweet of them. Um, the Fashion Expo on Tangle Grid has been extended until June 21st because they had some issues on a grid. They were literally hit by lightning. Yes. Right. They were actually hit by lightning. Uh, and... uh, Mary, can I, to kind of backtrack very quickly? Um, they've uh, contributed some OARs. Where are they available, do you know? Uh, there's a link to them on my website. Oh, right. Um, right, yeah. I did a little story about them. Or you can go to the XO Life um, website. Right. Uh, so the Fashion Expo is extended until June 21st, and you can get, still get a booth in there uh, if you want to show off some of your fashions. Uh, or your currently fashion store. Logicamp, they're a French grid with really low uh, region rental prices. They have been down for two weeks and the owner tells me that they have lost 20% of their inventories and close to 80% of their asset database. Oh, God. And so... He is asking people who have ores to re-upload them, and he 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 is trying to upload all the ore copies that he has, but he doesn't have all the ores for all the regions. So um, coming uh, after several other grids have had backup issues, and Melanie, you're an expert in <laughs> good backups. Um, you know, it's really surprising that he he had this problem right after several grids had because when other people have a backup problem the first thing you do is check your own backups and make but sure that is, uh, us that's usually locking up the stable after the horse is bolted so um the uh oh. the thing with backups is um you don't need them until you need them right yeah. but you so, uh, generally when somebody else has a problem that's when you check your own backups to double check some people do. Well, unfortunately, yeah. not everybody does. And um, backing up assets in particular is a, a very uh, difficult proposition because of the sheer size. Right, right. We're talking about terabytes of backup that oftentimes have to be backed up over metered lines. Yeah. And, uh, uh, I, and, and so I have uh, one. So we're talking about Cam Napier already. Uh, Kitely is making hyper good delivery, delivery easier. They created a link for grids to give to people that would automatically add the grid to the currently market if it's not added yet. And they've reduced the number of choices for delivery. You can either del deliver it to your currently avatar or you can deliver the content to any other avatar. Um, so they've simplified the whole process. So they've that's also, a limitation. How? What was it before? So before it was you had three choices to yourself, to another avatar or to your avatar on another grid. And so they've just dropped it down to two choices, to your Kitely avatar or any other avatar. Um, that makes sense because in everybody, every other avatar is just every other avatar. Exactly. And they've also extended their timeout. If you're sitting there not doing anything, um, they've, it's now uh, an hour long timeout, which is useful uh -huh. for people attending meetings yes, and indeed. just like sitting there <laughs> twiddling their thumbs. Yes. Yeah. And well, I, uh, to be honest, I don't even understand why there has to be a timeout at all. Because it, they pay by the hour 
and they're able to offer the prices that they are because they know that regions are going to be down most of the time. Because well, but that, is, that, is when, that is when you deliver to a Kitely region, but obviously delivering across the hypergrid, I don't see a purpose well, in no, the timeout. It's, the timeout has nothing to do with the market. The timeout is for the regions themselves. Oh, I see. There's no timeout in the market. No, the timeout is for when you're sitting in a meeting in a Kitely region and people are to, and nobody's moving or doing anything, uh, it will ask yeah. you, are you still there? Are you still there? Are you still there? I actually don't have a Kitely account, so I never right. did experience that. Yeah. It was always my impression that uh, as long as an avatar is in the region, the region stays up. No, no, I've, got, I've quite frequently been to a meeting, you know, in a half an hour of um, sitting down, trying, you know, not doing much other than listening, and I get locked out because... Uh, they think I'm being idle, and uh, kind of this um, business model is the uh, the idea really is that it's not a pervasive, but right. uh, and then there, and there's it's just simply a um, all the regions are there, and they can be brought online as and when they're wanted, but they're not necessarily there until they're called for. And there's two good I reasons. Guess I understand the concept. There's... What there's I was two, saying is, I always two... thought the region would stay up while an avatar is in there, regardless of whether they're idle or not. Right. There's th two reasons for that. First, people walk away from their computers, the screen goes off, they forget that the computer is on, uh, you know, two days later they come back and, you know, their region has been up all this time. The second uh, reason is because sometimes when you log out, your avatar is still uh, registered as present on the region. The, I, I don't know how big a problem that is on Kitely. It's sometimes just showing up on other grids. And finally, they don't want people to game the system leaves an avatar on the region all the time so people teleporting into uh to a sleeping region don't have to wait for it to boot up well but i don't see why that is an issue actually because if somebody leaves an avatar on the region all the time then he just pays for the region full time and that should be his decision as it, i don't call that gaming the system to yeah but I think, they've, they've I dropped it's, it's, they've it's, stopped it's, metered pricing a long time ago and it's, uh, yeah, and it's visitors too. I, I should say yeah. that um, Ilyan, I think his name is, from Kindly, should be with us on the show in two weeks' time. We'll be in Second Life next week, but yeah. um, he should be here with some interesting news um, in two weeks. Yeah, because I think the prices are uh, going to be changing this week. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they've, they have they have unlimited usage for premium accounts. And then for the flat rate billing, it's a flat rate, also unlimited usage. Okay, that, that explains it fully? Yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, otherwise, yeah, you're right. They could just rack up people's bills. Uh, although the customers uh, well, are really uh, upset. Well, phone companies do the same thing. Yeah, but uh, I think that they would lose a lot of users if they charge people when people forgot to log out. Because um, people would get paranoid about being okay. unkindly and then we go to other grids. Let's uh, let's move on because okay. uh, we're, we're, one, we're over one, time. Yeah, we're okay, over time. One, <laughs> one quick last thing. Uh, several groups are working on an alternative to open sim creations. Uh, nobody has anything final set up yet. It's being discussed in Google Plus. There's better freebies. There's OS Exchange. Outworlds has has a page, and there's rumors that Zetamax is working on a freebie store, online freebie marketplace as well. So okay. keep an eye out for those things if you are a creator who likes to share their content under a Creative Commons license. Okay. And, and um, that's it for me. Right. I would like to add one other thing because I was um, I can actually find somebody who didn't speak German and I was spoke English uh, to come along today. But uh, Metropolis, um, uh, the um, if you ever see avatars around saying hypergroup.org, that is actually um, Metropolis. Um, a German grid, but they popular grid internationally, and they're um, they're celebrating their big anniversary at the moment. Um, so there's lots of events going on on Metropolis, and um, I was reading Google Plus earlier, and there were some big, big events. Uh, oh, don't get me started night. on them. <clears throat> okay, I won't. <laughs> we're running out. Pardon me, we're running out of time anyway. But. Um, well, uh, oh, you got me curious now, but they are having a birthday. Well, very simple. It's something that um, I deeply object to is their possession of the domain hypergrid.org, which, uh, in my opinion, um, from a moral point of view, belongs to Krista Lopez. 
She's the yeah. one uh, had done most of the uh, work on Hypergrid and them uh, making money off, on the back of a domain uh, that represents a, cause, a concept that they didn't create is something that goes against my grain, which is why I've never been you there. Know, you know, that's a very good point. I never thought of that. I mean, I, 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 where Krista was on the show. In my opinion, um, yeah. the, the right thing to do for them would be to give Hypergrid org to Krista Lopez or to the OpenSim Foundation Overti, or um, to some other non-profit entity that can use it to promote the hypergrid as a concept rather than a single grid that just happens to be hypergrid enabled and has hijacked and squatted that domain um, for their own profit. How do you do that? I, you know, I had never, that had never occurred to me. I mean, we haven't got time to get into that now, and I'm not sure we should, but um, that is a very good point because well, why isn't it a website called Metropolis? Very good point, very good point. I never thought of that. Uh, your thoughts, please. Senators, by the embed code, uh, Google Plus or something. It's always good to hear um, hear what you think of um, little things like this and they slip into the conversation. And it's a very good point. It's a very good yeah, point. Yeah, I totally agree with you guys. That is, uh, it's a very inappropriate domain name for a grid. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, it occurs to me that Tara never got an intro with her news either. So um, I, 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 it's about it. before we wrap, um, I'm going to hand it to Tara for any other things she's uh, uh, um, <laughs> yet <laughs> to slip in. <laughs> yeah, well, fortunate, fortunately, I can do this as pretty much as bullet points. Uh, first off, June first is coming up, and that is the launch date for the next round of the of the Arcade Gotcha, which is the premier. Uh, gotcha event in Second Life and a great place to see what amazing things um, hot designers are creating and particularly in mesh of all sorts and not you know lots of it's not closed so uh, it's great fun to go look and it's an easy place to, <laughs> to uh, drop some lindens I, given, um, given that we're in Second Life next week I guess we'll probably have a show and tell <laughs> well maybe if I can get in before before oh, the right. show uh, yeah. it's, always, it's always a zoo the first several days Anyway, um, premium, Second Life Premium members now can have 60 groups, which is an increase from 42 and from a long shot from the old days of 25. Um, the 1920s Berlin Project is celebrating its sixth anniversary, started yesterday and runs through next Wednesday. Check their website, 1920sberlinproject.wordpress.com for the particulars. Um, if you hurry and if you've already got something in your head, you still have... Uh, the rest of today to get an application in for the next round of the LEA uh, artist and resident SIM uh, grants. Uh, the deadline is today, um, and those will be awarded the first of, uh, for occupancy the first of July, and will be avail They will have them until uh, the end of December. Um, let's see. Um, and my last item, fun little item tidbit from Anara Pay Maxwell Grantley. Uh, is the nom de plume for an anonymous school teacher living in a small seaside town on the east coast of Great Britain. Uh, although he has written short stories, graphic novels, and picture books, he does not think of himself as an author. He is first and foremost a mathematics teacher. Uh, he writes solely because he enjoys doing it for no other reason. And he uh, uses Second Life as the place where he creates illustrations for his stories. And uh, there is one of his, he has a number of his stories available for purchase uh, on Amazon uh, in, uh, the, in the various uh, um, Kindle versions. And currently you have another two or three days you can go pick up Timothy's Big Adventure, which is one of Maxwell Grantley's books. And it's free. Um, and, uh, you can, and you can send it to any, any version of uh, um, Kindle. Kindle. To look at, right. yeah, it definitely sounds like something worth checking out. Uh, he's, it sounds like he has fun with them, and he's and apparently his styles. He he, some of his stuff is kids' books, but he does not specifically write for kids. And in fact, he writes to suit himself. So his his styles and what and genres are all over the all over the landscape. So, and um, that's it for me. Okay, I'm just um, looking at my um, second life feed then because I saw no I was there. Um, if you want more um, things, uh, media like magazines, uh, videos, and major uh, second life destination type arts links, 
uh, you can follow my other Twitter stream at twitter.com slash malburns underscore writer, which is my second live avatar name. I'm not going to read anything out from the list here because we really haven't got time, but you can find um, a whole load of links um, by um, going there. So, um, before, without further ado, we're going to call it a wrap. I am actually going to go around um, everybody uh, for any last minute thoughts. Anything that's excited you in the last week or is exciting you in the coming week, um, maybe. Maria first. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how Kitely changes the prices, and I'm putting together my overview of all the all the virtual communities, see who's growing and who's the losing people. Fair enough. Look forward to that information. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, Canada's growing, of course. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, Manny. Well, you catch me quite unawares, actually, because I've been so sl swamped with work <laughs> that I um, really can't say what I'm more looking forward to. Um, there's just so many things. Um, I'm have to take a pass this time. Well, I was going to say, what you're looking forward to is a rest from the work. <laughs> oh, that, that actually might be the one thing, yes. <laughs> Fair enough, fair enough. We all need a break. <laughs> he says, falling asleep. <laughs> right, uh, Tara, anything else? Yeah, well, you know, my only other thing is I, I hope to solve a mystery of why a fairly simple house, I've been creating a version two of the what I've come to call the uh, uh, the reaction grid house, um, I've been creating a version two of, and how come uh, it is showing it is showing up as over, I'm showing up as 500 and some odd prims uh, on a region where that's basically the only show in town. Um, and so far, it's not making any sense. So <laughs> I've got to solve that mystery. Indeed. indeed. Well, it seems <laughs> to be something that's solvable, though. Yeah. Oh, good. yes, I'm sure it is. I, you know, it, you know I'm, wonder, I'm wondering if there's, if, if there's <laughs> odd things that are buried underneath the surface of the, of the soil that aren't yeah, showing up. Uh, oh, we, we, owned by it. We have actually yeah. had some interesting problems in Canada recently. I mean, there are major <laughs> yeah. problems, but you know, I, I I will bring something in for the hydrogen, for example, and I'll res it in um a, you know um Melbourne's Outland or something, which is two sims apart from Tara's, and it won't res or it will res, and I'll log in another time and it's gone and it suddenly appears somewhere over Tara's regions, two regions away. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, it, 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 it's not quite. <laughs> logical but um yes i suspect uh, maybe tara has got buried under her landscape the, her, the few thousand things that i've rezzed on others <laughs> on, 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 on regions miles away <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah anyway we'll find out well it doesn't show up on the on the list of owners. you don't show up in the list of owners so that's what's oh, mysterious well. about it so you haven't got a, a you haven't got anything in a skybox or anything no no the only place i've got a skybox is over a different sim so, okay. I, I, yeah, I'm just anyway. That's my mystery. I'll solve it, and I'll re you'll get a report back when I have when I have yeah. solved the mystery. Okay. Well, I love a good mystery. Yeah, I know, I know. We'll, we'll, we'll probably go offline and uh, uh, say good night with a murder mystery or something. <laughs> we're, we're all fans of mysteries, and uh, but of course, my other feed does include the list of months and various things like that. But we will be in second life next week. So um, uh, hopefully we'll have um, some of our regulars, people like on and living with us, to give us a roundup of all the arts destinations and maybe sit, maybe get cinders along for a roundup of hunts as well. Um, anyway, uh, that is next week. So uh, for, to, for this week, that is a wrap. We've actually got a two-hour show on our hands, which is just like the old days, I'm sad to say. <laughs> um, I, hope, I hope you've enjoyed it and born with us. But for now, I'm just going to wish you good morning or good evening or good afternoon, or indeed a good tomorrow, depending on wherever and whenever you are. And we will return next week.